I want to review an interesting hemodynamic case with clinical echo and hemodynamic learning features. So this is a 68 year old man with no prior major medical history. He was admitted to an outside hospital for one month of dyspnea and lower extremity edema. He was clearly congested clinically. On echo, he had normal EF and enlarged IVC, according to the report. He was diuresis 40 pounds and discharged with a rising creatinine of 2.1. The important idea here, they called uh, this patient heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and they diuresed him and sent him home on Lasix. But before you call somebody heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, take a step back and think. Beside the standard heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is associated with age, obesity, hypertension, AFib, the so-called H2PEF clinical risk score, beside that standard heart failure with preserved EF, always think of heart failure mimicker and look for their ancillary features. The top two to always think about in those patients are infiltrative disease, mainly amyloidosis, and this can be seen in the older patient. And we know that patients over the age of 65 presenting with heart failure with preserved EF, 10 to 15% of them have actually TTR amyloidosis, mainly the wild type senile amyloidosis. But also younger patient may have TTR, the genetic TTR mutant amyloidosis. You could also have Fabry disease in a younger patients. You could have sarcoidosis. So always think of eliminating infiltrative cardiomyopathy and look for their ancillary features, whether clinically on EKG and on echo. The second big thing is constrictive pericarditis. Then you can also think of other illnesses such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restrictive or obstructive phenotype. Particularly, Think of those heart failure mimicker, especially the first two, when you have a clinical picture of predominant right heart congestion, such as this particular patient. Now, here is his echo from the outside hospital. So the striking abnormality here is the septum. You can see that the septum is moving abnormally. I'll explain it more in details, but even if you're not an expert in abnormal septal motion, there is a clearly an abnormal septal motion here. And what's the differential diagnosis? That alone can give you the diagnosis of this patient. So there are three big diagnoses of abnormal septal motion. Left bundle branch block, right ventricular volume overload, and constrictive pericarditis. Well, it's very easy just knowing those three and looking at this echo, this patient doesn't have left bundle branch block on his EKG, and you can even measure the QRS width on this EKG here. Number two, he doesn't have RV volume overload. That RV is small. So already just by looking at that very simple echo frame, you can tell that this is good probability of constrictive pericarditis. Now, you can have more finesse here and try to delineate exactly what kind of septal motion abnormality you have. Because in each one of those three, the septal motion abnormality is, is different. For example, in uh, RV volume overload, you have abnormal septal motion between systole and diastole. In systole, the septum is push toward the RV in diastole, the septum is pushed toward the LV, which is opposite to the normal motion. In constrictive pericarditis, the abnormal septal motion is not between systole and diastole. It's between inspiration and expiration. The septal position, it changes more gradually between inspiration and expiration, not between systole and diastole. Then there is a second septal abnormality in constrictive pericarditis. Beside the inspiration expiration, a change in septal uh, position, you have what we call a septal shuddering, that instantaneous 
densing of the septum. That septum is constantly densing, is not staying in, in place because there is constant fighting between the RV and LV for space. In constrictive pericarditis, both RV and LV are constrained inside the stiff shell. They cannot expand outward. They have to expand at the expense of each other. So the septum keeps dancing even within the same beat and it dances furthermore, more dramatically between inspiration and expiration. In inspiration, the RV is big and the septum is pushed toward the LV. In expiration, the LV gets bigger and the septum is pushed toward the RV. So we can do fine tuning of that septal motion on M mode or by a 2D eyeball assessment. But even if you're not that good, just knowing that you have three differential diagnoses and it's clearly not the first two should make you highly suspect constrictive pericarditis in this patient. And here I will tell you more uh, fine tuning. Uh, if you look at that septal motion, you can see that the septum is constantly dancing, constantly dancing. And at one point in time, it gets a bigger motion. At one point in time, as it's dancing, it gets a bigger push toward the LV. And those are the two septal motion abnormalities you're seeing. You're seeing that instantaneous shuddering that we call septal bounce. And you can also see that more abrupt motion during inspiration, wherein it's the septum is pushed toward the LV. So you see both motion actually by eyeball. So instantaneous movement, then a big push, big push during inspiration. So we have the respirophasic septal motion abnormality and you have the septal bounce. Already highly suspicious for constrictive pericarditis. There are other findings on that eco-suggestive of pericardial disease. Notice that the patient has pericardial thickening and a little bit of pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion and a little bit of pericardial thickening here. Furthermore, on another hospital presentation at the outside hospital, they got this echo. And you can see at that presentation, he has pericardial thickening and he's having now more pericardial effusion. Look at this long axis view. He has a lot of pericardial thickening and he has pericardial effusion. Usually the finding of abnormal septal motion and abnormal uh, hemodynamics in a patient with pericardial thickening and pericardial effusion is suggestive, not just of constrictive pericarditis, it's suggestive of an inflammatory form of constrictive pericarditis. The heart is constrained by an inflamed pericardium. This is the so-called inflammatory constrictive pericarditis, also called effusive constrictive pericarditis. So those patients have inflammation of the pericardium that constrains the ventricles and they tend to have a fluid with it. In fact, a proportion of patients with tamponade, so patients who may have a much larger pericardial effusion along with inflammation, you drain those patients their hemodynamics improve, but they don't recover. They still have a degree of failure. Their RA pressure is still high. Those are patients who had tamponade, but they also have a degree of inflammatory constriction. So you drain them, they still have hemodynamic compromise. So those are the patients who have an inflammatory constrictive pericarditis, uh, frequently with an effusion, sometimes with a large effusion. That form of constrictive pericarditis is usually reversible and transient with uh, anti-inflammatory medications. So when you see this abnormal septal motion that you believe is due to constrictive pericarditis, the probability is already high. Now, how do you prove it? It's very simple. According to the Mayo Clinic analysis, if you have a combination of two of the following three features, you've already established the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. So we have the respirophasic septal shift and septal bounce in this patient. If you have any of the other following two features, you've already established the diagnosis. If you have what we call annulus inversus, 
you establish a diagnosis, or if you have abnormal hepatic vein Doppler flow, you have a pronounced reversal of the hepatic vein D diastolic flow in expiration, then you establish the diagnosis. And in this particular patient, at the outside institution, they did medial E prime and lateral E prime. Medial E prime was high, higher than nine centimeter per second. And it was higher than lateral E prime. So any of those medial E prime more than nine or medial E prime more than lateral E prime or more than 0.9 of lateral E prime, along with the respirophasic septal shift establishes the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. So we've already established the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. That annulus reverses is explained by the fact that the lateral annulus, lateral mitral annulus is constrained by the thick stuck pericardium. So in diastole, to compensate for the impaired lateral elastic recall, the medial annulus recalls excessively. So the medial E prime is higher than the lateral E prime. So this patient, the diagnosis is already established for constrictive pericarditis. But you need to have a high alert for this diagnosis, not just call him, okay, I'm diuresing him, and this is heart failure with preserve F, I'm sending him home on Lasix. Unfortunately, that's what happened in this patient and kept getting readmitted to the outside institution with decompensated heart failure and kept receiving diuresis. Seven months later, his heart failure kept progressing. He became unresponsive to diuretics and his kidney dysfunction kept progressing. So he was admitted to our hospital. I want to provide one additional note regarding uh, abnormal septal motion. There is a fourth differential diagnosis of abnormal septal motion, but it is quite different from the other three. It's post-op septal motion. This is seen in patients who had a prior cardiac surgery. In this case, the whole heart is fixated anteriorly and attached to the sternum. The pericardium and the whole heart is attached to the sternum as a form of post-op adhesion. So during systole, the whole heart gets pulled anteriorly, including the RV, the septum, and the posterior wall. Notice that the septum continues to thicken normally and simultaneously to the posterior wall, unlike the other condition. So abnormal septal motion that is post-op is different from the other ones because the septum and the posterior wall continue to contract and thicken simultaneously. It's just the whole heart gets pulled anteriorly. And if you know the patient had prior cardiac surgery and you understand and memorize that one image I'm showing, you will be able to recognize that pattern. It's a very different pattern from the other three. The whole heart is pulled anteriorly, anteriorly because it's anchored to the sternum. To go back to our patient, so he was admitted to our institution seven months later. And on exam, he was clinically in uh, shock. His blood pressure was low. He was in sinus tachycardia. He has anasarca. He had significant uh, large ascites clinically, four plus edema. Uh, he has the elevated creatinine. He had elevated bilirubin, low albumin, so already abnormal liver function. His lactic acid was elevated. He had large bilateral pleural effusions. We did a right heart cath and left heart cath. So I want to explain the hemodynamic findings in this patient and in constrictive pericarditis in general. So this is the right atrial pressure. You have deep X and deep Y with an M-shaped morphology, and you have the Kussmaul sign, meaning the mean RA pressure doesn't, doesn't change much with the respiration. It changes less than three millimeter of mercury. It's a very high RA pressure. The mean is about 27 millimeter of mercury with no significant variation with the respiration. This is the Kussmaul sign. This tracing is extremely common on our right heart catheterization and is overwhelmingly seen in right heart failure, 
and is totally unrelated to constrictive pericarditis. It is consistent with constrictive pericarditis, but it is overwhelmingly just right heart failure. It's very non-specific for constrictive pericarditis. Same with this, this is RV pressure recording. So you have several features that are consistent with constrictive pericarditis, but are much more commonly seen in just RV failure. You have that, what we call dip plateau pattern. You have a very quick rise of the RV diastolic pressure after the initial dip. And you have a poor RV function that's not able to generate an RV systolic pressure. So you have an RV and PA systolic pressure less than 55 with an RV diastolic pressure that is over a third of the RV systolic pressure. So RV diastolic pressure divided by RV systolic pressure is over one third. So all those features, RV systolic pressure less than 55, dip plateau pattern with a rapid diastolic filling wave, and RV diastolic pressure divided by RV systolic pressure more than one third, all those features are consistent with constrictive pericarditis. And they must be seen in constrictive pericarditis. However, they are not specific for it. And they are practically, in our daily right heart catheterization, much more commonly indicative of right heart failure than of constrictive pericarditis. So if someone asks you to diagnose constrictive pericarditis purely with right heart catheterization, tell him that you cannot. You need to do simultaneous left and right ventricular recording. You can rule out constrictive pericarditis by right heart catheterization if you have no Kuzmol sign and if you have RV diastolic to RV systolic ratio less than one third and if you have RV systolic pressure over 55, you can rule out constrictive pericarditis with right heart cath, but you cannot rule it in. If you have all those, those are consistent with constrictive pericarditis as much as right heart failure. Then you need to do left and right heart recording to make the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis and distinguish it from just right heart failure or restrictive cardiomyopathy. And this is a paper from circulation that illustrates what I just said. The criteria of a Kuzmol sign is highly sensitive for constrictive pericarditis, but it's not specific at all. It's frequently just right heart failure. The same with PA or RV systolic pressure less than 55 or RV diastole divided by RV systole more than one third. This is a perfect illustration of RV diastole divided by RV systole more than one third. But you see it with right heart failure. You have a very poor RV, for example, that can barely generate any pressure. So we get a big and massive backward failure with a high RV diastolic pressure and high RA pressure and very poor systolic pressure from the very low cardiac output. So it doesn't have to be constrictive pericarditis. Now, in order to prove constrictive pericarditis, you need to do simultaneous left and right heart catheterization. And this is where you get the specific feature. And this is the single most important recording is the simultaneous LV RV recording. Some people are obsessed with end diastolic equalization of pressure. This again is very sensitive, but it's very non-specific. It's frequently seen with right heart failure and with biventricular failure and with restrictive cardiomyopathy. It doesn't indicate constrictive pericarditis. It's extremely non-specific. What you should care for on simultaneous LV RV Recording it is the systolic behavior. You need to analyze the LV systole and RV systole in inspiration and LV systole and RV systole in expiration and see if they move similarly, which is what we call concordance, or not, which is what we call discordance. Now, most doctors are familiar with this recording. Here, the RV pressure goes up in inspiration. The LV pressure goes down. This is indicative of RV, LV competing for space. 
within the constraint shell and an indicative of constrictive pericarditis. However, unfortunately, in my experience, while most doctors can tell the diagnosis based on a book style image, they cannot tell it on a real life, not very clean image. This was the image obtained in this case and the operator who did this case called it indeterminate. In my opinion, this the diagnosis here is definitive for constrictive pericarditis. And here are the tips I want you to know in order to analyze those tracings. There are four major tips you need to know. One, when we're analyzing inspiration versus expiration, well, how do you know which beats to compare? You look at the diastolic dips. You see those dips here? Inspiration is the beat that follows the lowest dip. So you pick the inspiratory beat, which is the beat that follows the lowest dip. So here, this is the lowest dip here. So this is an inspiratory beat, the one that follows it. Expiration is the beat that follows the highest dip. So this is expiration, for example, here. So you take inspiratory beat and expiratory beat. That's one idea. Second idea, do not compare just the systolic peaks. You have to compare the systolic area under the curve. So you have to look at the bulk of the tracing. So in inspiration, this is the RV, the whole bulk, and this is the LV, the whole bulk below that orange curve. And you compare to the bulks here, the RV is becoming much smaller in expiration, whereas the LV bulk is becoming much bigger. So this is discordance. Don't compare the systolic peak, compare the bulks. The third idea is that sometimes in underdamped tracing, you, ha you get excessive spiking. So much so that all those diastolic dips look alike. They all go almost to zero. So it's hard to tell what is peak inspiration and what is peak expiration. In those cases, what you need to do, you need to reduce underdamping and you can suck a little blood in your catheter to damp the tracing a little bit so you can see and discriminate which dip is deepest and find what is inspiration and what is expiration. A fourth very important tip is it's not always clear on one recording whether you have concordance or discordance. You need to obtain many recording and you need to do it in regular quiet breathing, but also in deep breathing. And you need to do it uh, after PVC. A well-timed PVC may accentuate discordance, as is the case here. The RV systolic area bulk dramatically goes up after the PVC, while the LV systolic area bulk dramatically goes down after a PVC. And the analysis of that post-PVC behavior further confirmed the diagnosis beside the analysis of inspiration versus expiration. There is a dramatic discordance after a PVC. You have the LV and RV competing for space within this constrained shell. After a PVC, they cannot both increase their preload. One of them will increase their it's preload at the expense of the other. So you may accentuate discordance with a PVC. However, this is not always the case. It depends on the pause, how long of a pause you get after a PVC. If, is it long enough to elicit and to exacerbate that discordance? And it also depends how underfilled the ventricles are. For example, if your PVC, if you're preceded by a bunch of short RR intervals, so much so that your ventricles are very empty, way below the pericardial constraint, they may be concordant after a PVC. So PVC exaggerate discordance, but not always. And also you want a regular irregularity. You don't want an irregular rhythm that is completely irregular as in AFib because a repetitive short RR cycle may cause both the RV and LV to be very empty below the pericardial constraint, so they become 
concordant after a pause. So you don't want AFib, you want PVC, but if you have AFib, actually to do the study, you need to place a pacemaker and pace them at a rate faster than their ventricular rate to analyze the uh, respiratory behavior of the RV, LV systolic pressures. So those are the four tips. Record many tracing, quiet and deep breathing with and without PVCs. Pick the peak inspiratory beat based on the lowest diastolic dip and the peak expiratory beat based on the highest diastolic dip. If all the dips are too deep, under damp, may damp your tracing by aspirating some blood so you can see the, dip, the dip's depth. It is un un important to analyze the systolic area, the bulk, not the peaks. This is another recording from the same patient. It's not as clear as that recording. You know, if you look here, this is the expiration. It follows the highest diastolic dip. This is inspiration. It follows a lower diastolic dip. We compare this to that. Clearly, the LV is declining in inspiration. The RV is probably increasing in inspiration, but it's not clear to the eyeball. It's more obvious if you take that beat than if you compare those beats. It's here clearly an inspiration. The LV is down, RV bulk, not systolic peak, but the RV bulk is up. Whereas in expiration, the RV bulk is down, the LV bulk is clearly up. PVC here, note, it did not help. Okay, you did not ex exaggerate discordance after the PVC or not clearly at least, probably because it was preceded by short RR interval. So both ventr ventricles were empty uh, below the pericardial constraint uh, before the PVC. So they both went up after the pause. This is another recording from the same patient. Uh, again, it shows you that you need to be patient, obtain multiple recordings over several minutes with and without deep breathing, with and without PVCs. And actually you get all those recordings and you go back to the controller room and you analyze those tracings quietly. So this here, this is expiration that follows the highest dip. This is inspiration here. It follows the lowest dip. This is the lowest dip. This is inspiration. This is a higher dip. This is expiration. The RV here bulk is clearly going up while the LV bulk is going down. This is discordance. Again, if you go by the peak, the RV peak is going down, but it's not the peak we care about. It is the bulk, the bulk, the whole area, height and width. It is going up. So this is discordance. You can look at that. This is expiration after the highest diastolic dip. This is inspiration here, this and that. And clearly the bulk is going up. The bulk of the RV is going up in the inspiration while the LV is going down. Again, look at the bulks. They are behaving in opposite direction. And to make it simple, you pick one inspiratory beat, one expiratory beat. Again, this is another case on that same tracing, expiration, Bulk of the RV, bulk of the LV, inspiration. This is the lowest dip here. The, the tracing that follow that lowest dip, this is inspiration. Okay, the bulk of the RV here is going up, whereas the bulk of the LV is going down. It may not be as obvious on this as on those comparisons here or here. Again, it shows you the importance of doing multiple recordings. So when you have RV failure clinically with elevated filling pressures, along with this respiratory discordance between RV, LV systolic pressures, you have a pericardial process. So the respiratory discordance is what we call RV, LV interdependence that varies with respiration. That's what respiratory discordance is. It's not just RV, LV interdependence, which you see in RV failure, compressing the LV. So in this patient, the diagnosis is established in my opinion. It was already established by ECHO. You had two of the three major features. Now it's established by CATH based on those recordings. So he has constrictive pericarditis. 
you may do other imaging for a variety of reasons. One, you can do CT scan to uh, help the surgeon preoperatively in order to do the pericardiectomy, and it will provide supportive features. Thick pericardium is a supportive feature for constrictive pericarditis. This patient had a thick four millimeter pericardium without calcium. Interestingly, keep in mind that up to 20% of constrictive pericarditis have an inelastic pericardium that is not thick. So not having a thick pericardium on CT does not rule out constrictive pericarditis. But having a thick pericardium in conjunction with what I showed is an additional nice feature to have to support surgical referral. Another thing you can do is cardiac MRI. Now, why would you do cardiac MRI here? There is an important reason to do cardiac MRI in this particular patient is what I described earlier. Up to 17% of patients with constrictive pericarditis may have a transient reversible constrictive pericarditis. This may be seen with idiopathic constrictive pericarditis, viral, and all etio etiologies except radiation, particularly when the onset of symptoms is recent. A pericardial effusion is often present in those transient constrictive, transient reversible constrictive pericarditis, sometimes large, sometimes even considered tamponade, and often with an inflammatory rind, that inflammatory mass is stuck on the pericardium. And most cases of effusive constrictive pericarditis are transient, in so much that the term transient constrictive pericarditis and effusive constrictive pericarditis and inflammatory constrictive pericarditis are equivalent terms. In those cases, constrictive physiology resolves sometimes spontaneously or with anti-inflammatory therapy within six months usually and mean two months. You can use a steroid and colchicine and NSAID if you can. And the following markers have been shown to identify and prove a reversible inflammatory constrictive pericarditis. Uh, cardiac MRI, you have a thick pericardium that has late gadolinium hyperenhancement of the pericardium. The normal pericardium and the fibrotic scarred pericardium do not enhance with gadolinium. A thick pericardium that heavily enhances with gadolinium is indicative of inflammatory type of constrictive pericarditis. Another feature would be elevated uh, markers of inflammation, CRP and SED rate. In this particular patients, the clinical uh, progression does not suggest a transient constrictive pericarditis. He actually kept getting worse with time and he progressed to anasarca. Uh, rather than get better with time. However, the presence of effusion and the presence of what seemed like inflammatory mass stuck on the pericardium may want you to rule out a transient inflammatory constriction. So that's why we did the MRI in this case. The MRI shows thick pericardium, but there was no uh, hyperemic late gadolinium enhancement of that pericardium. On MRI, you can also get the same features you see on echo, that septal bounce, as well as the respirophasic abnormal septal motion. It is possible that this patient started off as a transient inflammatory constrictive pericarditis, but because of lack of appropriate initial treatment or non-response to inflammatory treatment, he progressed to a fibrotic pericardium. So the patient was taken for radical complete pericardiectomy. The surgeon found that the pericardium is thickened but not calcified. Postoperatively, the patient became hemodynamically unstable and uh, the echo postoperatively showed the following. So now we have a severely dilated LV and RV with severely reduced LV and RV systolic function. And actually now we do have abnormal septal motion that is due to RV volume overload. So this is a different septal motion than we had early on. Look at that big RV. 
with an abnormal septal motion. In systole, the septum moves toward the RV, in diastole, it gets pushed toward the LV. This is a paradoxical septal motion of RV volume overload. So, but what happened? Why all of a sudden you have dilatation of the ventricle and severely reduced systolic function? And here I want you to understand the concept of afterload and the concept of transmural pressure. So what is ventricular afterload? And, and this equation applies to the LV and the RV, but I will use here the LV for uh, simplification. So LV afterload is systolic LV radius size multiplied by systolic LV transmural pressure divided by two times myocardial thickness. Now, what is systolic LV transmural pressure? It's the LV systolic pressure, which is equal to, to the systolic blood pressure if you don't have LVOT or aortic obstruction, minus the surrounding pressure, which is a pericardial pressure. Okay? So this is the afterload, which is the wall stress, which is the Laplace law. Every cardiologist and every cardiology fellow need to know that equation. Okay, afterload is not simply aortic pressure and it's certainly not simply systemic vascular resistance. It's LV radius by LV transmural pressure in systole divided by two times myocardial thickness. So when you have tamponade or constrictive pericarditis, you have a high pericardial pressure. That high pericardial pressure will reduce the transmural, the LV transmural pressure. So the LV feels unloaded by the high pericardial pressure. The LV transmural pressure is reduced. Furthermore, in constrictive pericarditis, the LV is underfilled. So the LV radius is low. Therefore, in constrictive pericarditis and in tamponade, the afterload is massively reduced. You have small cavity and you have a small transmural pressure. This is particularly the case when they are at the stage of shock, at which point the pericardial pressure is high, but the cavity systolic pressure is low. So therefore you have a very low afterload. Furthermore, in constrictive pericarditis, you have a low afterload for a while, the myocardium becomes thin, it develops some atrophy. It's deconditioning, unloading atrophy. And this has been described in unloaded ventricles after prolonged bed rest. For example, you develop about 10% cardiac atrophy of the left ventricular mass after six weeks of bed rest and even more after 12 weeks. And you develop cardiac atrophy after just 10 days of space flight. So take this patient with constrictive pericarditis. His LV and RV are chronically unloaded. They have chronically reduced afterload and they are thin and atrophied. Now, all of a sudden, you remove that pericardial constraint so all of a sudden you're increasing the LV radius, you're increasing preload, but you're also increasing afterload by increasing the radius component of the afterload. You're also all of a sudden increasing the transmural pressure because you're eliminating that high pericardial pressure. So you're incre increasing the pressure and radius component of the afterload. So all of a sudden you have a massive rise in afterload on a myocardium that is thin. So you get a massive rise in afterload and the LV and RV both fail because of that massive rise in afterload. So you develop that biventricular systolic failure because you go from a very low afterload to a very high afterload. This is a syndrome that you can get after pericardiectomy. You may on occasion get it after draining a very large pericardial effusion in tamponade. It's uncommon in tamponade simply because it's a more acute process. So the LV hasn't had time to develop atrophy. The LV and RV have not had time to develop atrophy, but it may be seen with very large effusion that are partially chronic. 
So you develop biventricular failure because of a massive rise in afterload on a thin, unloaded, deconditioned ventricle. And this is what happened to this patient. So what was done for him is rightfully, uh, we placed Impella CP for support initially, then this did not do anything. So eventually uh, he underwent placement of Impella 5.5 and protect do RVAD. He continues, unfortunately, to deteriorate and his hemodynamics and, and organ function continue to deteriorate despite multiple pressors and biventricular support devices. Eventually, at 11 days post-op, the patient expired. Now, why did this happen? Unfortunately, the reason for that is that pericardiectomy was performed a bit too late. He has been in severe heart failure for practically seven months. And the point I want to make is that, unfortunately, the diagnosis was not recognized until he was transferred to us until seven months later. This should have been recognized early on. And these are some didactic slides. Basically, the three most common causes of constricted pericarditis are idiopathic viral, post cardiac surgery, and radiation. You can have connective tissue disease, uh, chronic infection, uh, such as TB, uh, HIV, it could also be causes of constrictive pericarditis. Uh, the prognosis of constrictive pericarditis dramatically depends on the etiology. Radiation constrictive pericarditis has the worst long-term prognosis. The best long-term prognosis is with idiopathic, as is the case of our patient had he been treated uh, earlier. Those are prognostic factors for constrictive pericarditis after pericardiectomy. The later you do the surgery in a patient who has massively elevated RA pressure and especially and organ damage, liver failure, ascites, and renal dysfunction, the more delayed you are, the less likely it is for that patient to survive post-operatively. Another thing is that you need to do full pericardiectomy, meaning you cut the, you remove the pericardium anteriorly to posteriorly, phrenic nerve to phrenic nerve, but you need to also cut it all the way posteriorly. This is what we call radical complete pericardiectomy. A radical pericardiectomy improves outcome compared to partial pericardiectomy. Another point I want to make, I made it about uh, afterload. So keep in mind, afterload is not simply systolic blood pressure, and it's definitely not systemic vascular resistance. This is a paper from Circulation 1988. Afterload is the Laplace law. It doesn't have a great correlation with systemic vascular resistance. Evidently, systemic vascular resistance has an effect of afterload indirectly. And in fact, I frequently see, you know, uh, somebody telling me this patient's uh, blood pressure is 80, but his SVR is elevated, so he has high afterload. No, his systolic blood pressure is 80. Therefore, the pressure component of the afterload is actually low. Now, his afterload may be high if you have cardiogenic shock with very dilated ventricle and systolic blood pressure of 80. Your afterload may be elevated because of the dilatation, but odds are with a systolic blood pressure of 80, your afterload is not severely elevated despite a severely elevated SVR. So again, afterload is not SVR. Keep that in mind.